Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this international conference titled Methodological Practices in Social and Political Activism Research. Hope you can all see and hear us. Um, so yes, just to um, uh, explain what, what uh, we're going to be doing, um, we've got some international um, guests uh, that are going to be presenting papers. Um, so I'm going to just list who's going to be appearing over the next couple of days and explain there's been a slight change in the, um, in the, in the order of, of proceedings. So we've got um, joining us uh, Professor Paul Lichterman, who is a professor in the Departments of Sociology and Religion at the University of South California. Um, and he will be presenting a paper titled Individuals and Social Settings in Research on Social Activism. We're also um, going to be joined by uh, Professor Yusuf Al Chasli from the University of Paris 8, um, who will be presenting later on this morning uh, a paper titled Another Post on the Wall, Reconstructing the Trajectories of Egyptian Revolutionaries Through Social Media Traces and Biographical Interviews. And we also have uh, Professor Virginie Laurent uh, from uh, the Department of Political Science here at the University of uh, the Andes. Professor Carlos Ramirez, who's the uh, organizer of this of this event, also from uh, the uh, political science department. Um, and we have um, uh, Professor Ingrid Bolivar, also from the, the same department. Um, so we were um, unfortunately uh, informed very late last night that um, uh, for health reasons, Professor Olivier Filleur had to withdraw at the last minute. We wish him well. Um, and uh, so that meant that we had to change the, the order. We were going to start with uh, Professor Lichterman, but um, we've uh, had to, to, as I say, rejig re things. So this morning we'll be starting with um, Professor Virginie Laurent, um, as I said, and we'll be uh, presenting the paper that I just mentioned, Individual Activism in Collective Dynamics, Reflections on Methodological Approaches to Practices of Political Resistance. And then after um, uh, Professor Laurent's uh, presentation paper, uh, it will be the turn of uh, Professor El Chasley. So the, the idea is that um, we uh, ideally will have uh, papers uh, that will last about 40 minutes. Uh, and then after each paper, there will be time for questions and discussion. I mean, this is, I should highlight really, it's a, a working event that we're eavesdropping on here. Um, so the idea is to sort of facilitate discussion between uh, the academics, but also um, there'll be time to, for people that are watching to ask questions, participate. So we would um, kindly ask, as, as, you know, as much as is possible to try to keep to that um, time schedule, um, but we can be reasonably flexible uh, given that we now have an extra hour. So yes, with that uh, brief introduction, um, I'm going to uh, elect uh, Professor uh, Carlos Ramirez uh, say a few words as he's the um, organizer of uh, this this conference so thank you very much many thanks Paul uh, first of all I would like to say good morning to those of you in the Americas and good afternoon to those of you in Europe on my behalf and on behalf of the university it is a pleasure to be able to inaugurate this event today between today and tomorrow, we will have six presentations by academics from universities in the United States, uh, Switzerland, France, and Colombia, on methodologies for the study of social and political activism. The event will uh, uh, thus move on a plane in which uh, epistemological and methodological discussions will be in the foreground. But without losing sight, in any case, of the anchoring of these discussions in empirical research, an interview on these issues, Charles Dealey said that an important part of the academic production of contemporary social sciences is more oriented towards very abstract philosophical discussions, their capacities and presuppositions, than on the interest in offering explanations of social phenomena. While both planes can and should be articulated, I believe it is always important to anchor such discussions within the limits of empirical research work. This criterion animates this event and the selection of its focus. 
This is not if we are able, if we are to dispel misunderstandings, a generic event on methodologies for the study of social movements. The speak of activism by the polysemy of the term has an intention here. Tension and intention of the concept of activism is not easy to pin down. The concept embraces both spontaneous and inter intermittent forms of political participation and other stable, routinized, and professionalized ones. It includes, in some cases, also as an adversary, the presence of the state, and in other cases, it occurs beyond its presence. Activism has purely local manifestations and others, even if it manifests itself locally with a universalist vocation. It can be a routine and predictable phenomenon in the manner of uh, domestication of participation, or it can have disruptive manifestations or within them some violent ones. The boundary between social and political activism is equally fluid since initiatives that may begin, for example, as specific efforts within a community of, user of, of users of a service may end up having connotations with respect to the understanding of the public good. However, even within this framework, a common element can be highlighted. Persian activism aims to understand and or explain the initiation, permanence, intermittency and lasting effects of the individual's participation in different types of form of political coordination, of, of action coordination, and in the face of different types of problems uh, perceived as common. The emphasis is thus on an individual-centered view of political participation. Studies on civic engagement in the social movements research the sociology of engagement or studies on radicalization can be seen from this perspective as different entries in, into the study of activism. It has been pointed out among other currents by what in France is called sociology of the individual, and I, here I am thinking of others uh, such as uh, Lahir or Marpichelli. This is not an entity whose study is outside of the social science possible to think in sociological, historical, or political terms of the formation, transformations, fragmentation, and self-staging of the individual. Concepts such as tests or dispositions are part of the conceptual repertoire to carry out this type of analysis. Studying activism presupposes methodologies that account for the impact on the on individual's biographies, certain political events, such as, for example, revolutions, for the role of their dispositions in collective action, their experiences of self-transformation, disillusionment and radicalization through short or extensive processes of participation. In this framework, methodologies such as ethnography, sequence analysis, or life histories may be relevant. Perhaps it could be said that the study of activism, if it involves focusing on the political activity of the individual, corresponds to an era in which neither hyper-socialized social agents whose identity depends mechanically on their primary socialization, nor social movements with a stable and relatively homogeneous composition, nor objective interest, nor a stable and predictable adherence to certain causes can be assumed, but one in which social and political life is traversed by the choices of individuals, by the mixed character of their identity, multiple militancy and by the intermittency of their commitments. This is, however, an assumption that we may be exploring over the course of these two days. For the moment, I would just like to invite the attendees to follow the discussions and to participate in them today and tomorrow. We will have over these two days an excellent list of participants, in which I would like to highlight above all the presence of professors Paul Lichterman and Joseph Chasley. We would like to thank them once again for their participation. It's a great opportunity for those of us who deal with the issue of activism to have the opportunity to speak with you. I hope that also for you and for all the participants, it will be an event full of valuable exchanges of ideas, discoveries, and new questions. Many thanks. Sorry, just unmute myself. Thanks, um, Professor Ramirez. Um...
those uh, introductory words. Um, so yes, it's um, I'll pass over to Professor Laurent. Um, I'll give you a reminder of the paper that she's kind of going to present. It's um, individual activism in collective dynamics, reflections on methodological approaches to practices of political resistance. So please go ahead, Professor Laurent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning to everyone. And thank you, Carlos, uh, for the invitation. I will just, I want to share my presentation. Some slides. And so, uh, well, I would like to share some thoughts on what I called individual activism in collective dynamics, and I could say more specifically within what can be perceived as a kind of practices of political resistances. And for this, uh, I will refer uh, to some parts of my research works. The first one on the experience of the Colombian indigenous movement, among other topics, these works considers the way in which the Colombian indigenous movement is linked to the idea of five centuries and three more decades uh, of resistance. And the second research I'm just beginning now focuses on contentious actions that have been arising in the last decades from different parts of the world, from the global south, but also in the global north, and that simultaneously grounded on the one hand, on identity rights and claims, for example, uh, as indigenous peoples, as African-Americans, as African South Americans, as members of LGBT groups, as peasants, students, and or environmentalists. But also on the other hand, on struggles against discrimination and marginalization, uh, struggles to say, Trump or Duque or Macron is not my president to express claims uh, for a more respectful relation with nature and or questioning of neoliberalism. Departing from these two works, I would like to contrast the experience of some indigenous leaders with the one of a French sheep farmer in the surroundings of Lyon who has been fighting against the building of the road, which leads to a big soccer stadium, but cuts off his fields. Also, I would like to stress what has been my methodological approach. While in both cases, I opted for an inductive path and qualitative tools, mostly related uh, to ethnography. Regarding my study on indigenous resistance, it's worth mentioning that an important part of my work deals with the projection of the indigenous movement into the electoral arena from the 1990s. When I started this work, it was a subject very little studied in Latin America and not studied at all in Colombia. However, some previous works focused on the emergence and consolidation of the indigenous movement in the continent. In this sense, my methodological procedure first went through a historical approach, among other aspects linked to the expressions of indigenous resistance since the arrival of the Spaniards to America. It was also founded on a consideration of the theories of social movements and the way in which the Colombian indigenous movement that appeared in the 1970s could be considered as a social movement. These initial steps helped me glimpse some significant elements for what was to be the next phases of my research. First, I could notice that within this indigenous movement that did not stop claiming and to a certain extent also sharing unity, there was the existence of, of the existence of different organizations which sometimes clearly appeared as rivals. For example, the 
Regional Indigenous Council of Cauca Creek, first organization to be formed in the country, and that led to the creation of the organization, the National Indigenous Organization of Colombia in 1982, but also the so-called movement of uh, indigenous, indigenous governors forward uh, in Marcha, and uh, the movement of indigenous authorities of Southwestern Colombia, and in the 1990, the movement of indigenous authorities of Colombia. These elements uh, emerged uh, from some opening interviews I could carry out with members of these indigenous organizations and academics. Likewise, I obtained a series uh, of information flyers and statements from these organizations, which reveal the not necessarily univocal nature of the indigenous struggle. From these organizations, and uh, as some of their names indicate, much emphasis was placed on the need to respect the traditional authorities. At the same time, there are numerous references to the legacy of the indigenous ancestors, for example, uh, from calls to the memory and the exemplary action uh, of some historical and or mythical hero heroes who laid resistance against uh, resistance actions throughout the century, uh, as one of them said in defense of the indigenous race, of course, uh, against colonization. Another significant point uh, at this early stage of my research was to identify the also central reference to the idea of community intrinsically linked to indigenous people's attachment to the land and the territory. Well, the community is the basis of the indigenous movement action, regardless any kind of possible divergences that arise within it. Indigenous people live in communities, indigenous territories or community territories. The property titles of those territories are collective property titles. Uh, and uh, within these collective territories govern community authorities and community rules. At some point in their lives, each one of the inhabitants of these territories must be at the service of their community during a certain time. Lastly, community works are conceived as a motor of the community as a collective effort from the common well-being, frequently known as mingas in the Indian area. And finally, to the extent that I was attentive to the projection of the indigenous movement into the local, regional, and national electoral sphere, I was interested in tracking electoral results. On this topic, it was worth, it is worth uh, remembering uh, that the indigenous participation in the electoral arena expressed not individually, but as a movement strategy only began at the end on the 1980s because of a reform that allowed the direct election of the mayors and later in 1990 with the convocation of a national constituent assembly, which led to the adoption of a new constitution in 1991. The 1991 constitution ratified the popular election of the mayors and also allowed the election of the governors of department. Moreover, it acknowledges the pluri-ethnic and multicultural character of the Colombian nation. In this sense, it ensured a series of rights for the indigenous peoples, among which their access to political representation through special districts and seats within the Congress. The opening of these new spaces for political representation and participation at national and subnational level contributed to motivating uh, an unprecedented, unprecedented 
indigenous prisons in the electoral competition. So from there, part of my research consisted in identify characteristics, personalities, and relations of forces within this new arena of the indigenous struggles. That implicated, for example, uh, to have a look at the fluctuations of the electoral results from one electoral period to another to distinguish and categorize the new political electoral organizations, as well as to know more about the profiles, trajectories, and actions of the candidates and people elected on their behalf. Starting from these first stages of figuring out uh, the indigenous electoral experience in Colombia, my research led me to spend several month periods in different indigenous areas of the country between 1995 and 2000. During this fieldwork stays and among many other activities, I had the opportunity to conduct around 200 in-depth interviews some of them with prominent figures of the indigenous electoral experience. Through this, seeking to retrace what I called fragments of life more than life stories, I was able to capture an important part of what interests us here in a more particular way, elements that help know more about individual activism within dynamics based on collective claims as it is explicitly the case with indigenous movements in Colombia and more broadly in Latin America. I will refer here to the indigenous leaders who were elected as members of the Congress. Interestingly, what stood out from these dialogues is not a sum of individual experiences, but also a series of shared traits. First, they can be described as a new elite of personalities who stand out besides the traditional community authorities. They can read and write, and they know the laws, in particular those on indigenous peoples, and at least the rudiments of the state apparatus. They can deal with national and international interlocutors, on the other hand, they are sometimes criticized for not always being respectful of the communal leaders and rules, what may lead to generational conflicts. The two oldest of them participated in the creation of the first indigenous organization, Creek Regional Indigenous Council of Colombia, before their paths separated in the early 1980s at the beginning of the constitution of the other subnational indigenous organization, Movement of Indigenous Authorities of Southwestern Colombia. Dedicated uh, to working the land since their childhood, they have been direct witnesses and victims of the lack of land and the exploitation of the Indians by the big land owners. These activists, from the first house of the indigenous mobilizations can be distinguished by their entry on the electoral scene at a relatively late stage in their lives, but under the spotlights above all because of their long-term and close work alongside the communities, the indigenous communities. For these men, these two men, learning about the national electoral scene remained temporary. After these parentheses, they return to their regions of origin and their usual activities within their communities and alongside their grassroots organizations. Apart from them, most of the other representatives of the indigenous movement who were elected in Congress did so when they were relatively young, in their 30s or 40s at the time of, of their election. They also are natives of indigenous communities and often are the sons of respected figures at the community level. In other words, leaders who exercise the office of traditional authority or who participated in the creation of the first indigenous organizations. They gradually, gradually came uh, to the public scene 
as the successors of the oldest after having proven their capacities within local and regional organizations. Several factors facilitated their socialization and integration. National education, their passage voluntary or obliged through the church, while school and church have become the places of meaningful encounters, encounters with other people to whom one is different, but also encounters with others who are also different. These places as places of knowledge where one learns to read and to write were converted in spaces where information circulates, for example, related to the living conditions of the indigenous peoples, as well as to the processes of organization and political projects. In addition, inclinations for religious life and abundant priestly vocations were numerous among these elected representatives. Several of them compare the activity within the indigenous movement with the priesthood insofar as in one case, as in the other, it would be a question of being in service to others. Interestingly, the terms activist activism were not present in their lexical register either in that of the indigenous organization in Colombia. On the contrary, uh, the resistance is mentioned very often as a matter of survival. Independently of their participation in the elections, these elected officials claim to be assimilated to members of their community like any others by extension, members of the grassroots organizations their communities are linked to like any others. They insist on the idea that they maintain a close and constant relationship with the representatives of the community authority. Moreover, beyond any personal interest profile trajectory, their position always revolves around the idea of movement collective struggle, and this independently of what in parallel could have been observed as organizational and partisan volatility. Finally, of course, the, the subjectivity of the actors involved is always present. They tell what they want from the perspective of their memory. And we know that memory is selective, especially when it comes to talking about oneself and uh, possibly even more when it comes to talk about a personal contribution to a movement for the well-being of the community. What is important in this is also related uh, to the truth, to, 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 to the idea um, in which uh, these individual and personal experiences with their part of truth or tr with their part of truth or truths in plural, possibly also with a part of fiction, the story through, through this truth, the story of the indigenous movement of Colombia is woven, of course, as a multi-voices story. Conversely, individual stories can be relocated from the history of the movement, from timelines, genealogies, structures, and actors, previously identified and or mentioned, not only from in-depth interviews and life stories, but also through more informal dialogues and sometimes just plain gossip. In several respects, uh, the meeting with the French sheep farmer was different. On the one hand, it took place in a much more recent period. On the other hand, the entire research process was intentionally carried out in an even more, I could say, intuitive way. Contrary to the research uh, experience on indigenous political mobilizations in Colombia, what I will present now does not correspond to the result of a long-term ethnography. Rather, it deals with some initial reflection 
from a first interview dialogue with him in the town of Dessine Charpieu. And the name of uh, the farmer is Philippe Laya, and here he is. This case seemed very interesting to me, first because of the way I came to know of its existence. Passing by car uh, on the road during one uh, of my summer vacation periods in France. In fact, it caught me, it caught my attention to see, in addition uh, to some sheep on both sides of the road, some banners denouncing the fact that the animals were left without their usual space. In addition to the parallel with the struggle of indigenous peoples for the protection of their territories, another possible connection came to my mind. The farmer's actions made me think of other initiatives implemented in France in recent decades from what is known as zones to defend, like for example, one that stood out with special disability and strength against the construction of an airport in the Western region. So the initiative of the sheep farmer entered the framework of these forms of resistance between the global south and the global north linked to my research interests. I really wanted to learn more about the case. I was also excited about the idea of a personal meeting with the man so that he himself would tell me about his experience. I discussed the case with some relatives who live in the same town as the farmer, and they sent me some other information shared on websites. Through these, I came to have a still general but somewhat more precise knowledge of the situation. I learned that the sheep farmer had a connection with a peasant organization known for having close ties with the left and quite radical means of action, the Confédération Paysanne, Peasant Confederation, close to Via Campesina from an international perspective. I found out that he joined the Yellow Vest movement Moreover, Philippe Laya had been victim of a beating. I also came to discover from informal chats with him and from the web that his case has definitely been the subject of reports by different media on the radio, TV, newspapers, and websites. So in his own way, my anonymous farmer was a kind of hero as well, conspicuous enough to be the main character of several news programs. Philippe Laya was explicitly presented as the leader of a resistance process. My meeting with him finally took place uh, on July the 3rd last year. I had a series of specific questions ready on the points I wanted to explore. His personal trajectory, focusing on what led him to get involved in the resistance process he is leading, the claims and the dynamics of such a process, their results, and more broadly, how he considers the possible links between his personal experience and similar practices of resistance in France and uh, in other parts of the world. However, the exchange with Laia was driven in a much more fluid way than a formal interview, what to a certain extent also made it more difficult. Spontaneously, Mr. Laya showed me his property. He wanted me to see the bad works that have been done, which he considers as aberrations of different kinds. In addition to having cut his field and the habitat on, of the sheep in two, there were, for example, the poor nature of the soil brought to his fields, an underground path you can see here uh, for the sheep from one side of the road to the other, the inappropriate and too sharp slope of the entrance to his property, the inadequacy of the field fencing, which does not prevent animals from escaping among others. Simultaneously, he emphasized the fact that his neighbors 
had a much more friendly treatment. Contrary to his agrarian land, their properties are considered as residential and therefore can be subject to a greater economic compensation. Anyway, from a broader view, the man pointed up his rejection of the idea of receiving any amount of money. For him, the problems go far beyond this issue. As we were walking around his property, he commented on matters I was particularly interested in. His relationship with collectives and people that could be considered as those who are leading the same kinds of struggle as his ones. Without hesitation, he mentioned in the conversation the support he received from the Peasant Confederation. But I was ast astonished by his response when I wanted to dig deeper into the point. In fact, when I asked him about the nature of his alliance with the organization, he, he let me understand that he had not been of any use because those who gave him their support were only seeking to serve their own interests. Likewise, during our dialogue, he pointed out the arrival of some alter globalists on his land. However, to my surprise, the way he referred to them was not in the best terms and above all, could not in any way reflect the shared struggle that I had entreated. He told me he didn't know what alter globalists are, what they are fighting for, and he stressed he didn't know that world alter globalists were for having them in his field. He let me clearly understand there is no possibility to a close collaboration and share struggle with them. So to conclude my talk, I would like to think about what these two experiences and their different approaches can tell us. And first, maybe we can ask how to compare them, to compare the incomparable. And to a certain extent, I think the two cases presented here may be difficult to compare because of their distance, both geographically and temporally, as well as from the distinctive characteristics that uh, surround the contexts in which they appear. However, the two experiences show a series of thought-provoking elements that also make interesting their comparison. In both situations, there seems to be a connection between collective dynamics of political resistance and individual activism. And I think the qualitative methodologic instruments, in my case, those related to ethnography, like in situ participant, uh, participative observation and in-depth interviews bring together the experiences described here. More specifically, the use of such tools tends to show the back and forth between first conceptual and contextual approaches, initial intuitions, and the testing of fieldwork. At the same time, they need a flexibility which may oppose some requirements of the construction, writing, conduct of a research project and what we could first call the real life. In fact, from the birth of a research project to the development, analysis, and sharing of its results and the reflections they inspire, the rigor and organizations of ideas, the articulation between theory and empirical procedures are crucial. Likewise, several universities require their researchers to have their research project examined by ethic committees and to have the persons interviewed during field work sign a free and informed concept form. Of course, these aspects are very important. However, the shift to the practice sometimes leads to unexpected situation. 
from which it is necessary to know how to adapt and which to a certain extent invite the researcher to carefulness and responsiveness. responsiveness. So finally, by their name, social movements and collective actions refer to what is shared, what is common, what comes from groups of actors confronted with the same types of issues and who bring the same types of claims. Most often, the study of these dynamics involves taking them into account as a whole to know the context in which they appear or maintained, disappear and or reappear, their causes and effects, the processes and mechanisms that drive them, the repertories of actions from which they are deployed. But within these collective dynamics, individual activism also deserves attention, particularly about the way it relates to collective dynamics. I hope the cases presented here help illustrate this point. Of course, it is no way permitted from any of the situation explored here to make undue generalizations. However, both by the specificity of each and by their contrast, they inspire reflection at a time and within the framework of a global movement, which in multiple expressions and in all languages shouts loud and clear, we are the resistance, the part of individual activism remains to be further explored. Actually, we frequently hear these days, I am because we are, but also I struggle, therefore I am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, that was very, very interesting. Um, I'd like to open the floor now to anybody that, that has any questions or any uh, comments. So yes, just to maybe we can take questions in, in English or, or Spanish. So yeah, the floor is yours. Would anybody like to ask Professor Laurent a question? Does anybody have anything uh, that they would like to address in relation to methodological, uh, methodological issues uh, raised by Professor Laurent's uh, paper or perhaps any other aspect? Carlos. Well, maybe I could ask you a question if you don't mind, but I could be so uh, impertinent. Um, I mean, I've studied myself in, uh, done some field work here in Colombia, but not with indigenous movements. Um, it was enough for me to learn Spanish. Um, how did you, do you speak in, in any of the indigenous uh, languages, Professor? And if you don't, uh, which wouldn't surprise me, um, when you conducted interviews with them, uh, with these uh, individuals and movements, I presume you would have had to do it in Spanish. And did you find that uh, a barrier in any way um, to, to sort of trying to find out what you were trying to find out? Thank you for your question, Paul. Well, I when I began, I didn't speak any indigenous language. I didn't know any word in any indigenous language. I was I, I, I was um, barely speaking Spanish. In fact, uh, when I when I first uh, began to study these kinds of topics, but um, more and. Um, Mostly the interviews were driven in Spanish because most of the people I was dealing with with speak Spanish uh, yeah. because they went to school and they learned to speak good Spanish because they were interested in, in, in taking part actively in the indigenous organizations and and claims and then going to the electoral sphere. But of course, there were situations in which the people I could uh, meet 
didn't speak Spanish. For I am thinking especially in the um, religious political authorities, because it's very interesting in the indigenous communities, you can find on the one hand, representatives of, of the communal councils, who could be described as political authorities, but there are also very important persons who are kind of uh, medicine men or shamans and uh, traditional doctors who have a very important role in maintaining a good situation within the community, but also speaking of electoral projects. Mm, sometimes they have the possibility to, to know in advance who will be a good candidate, who will be, win the election, or to explain after uh, the defeat of one or another of the candidates, or having a bad president uh, in Colombia explaining that they knew it. So um, these people in, in, in some situation didn't speak Spanish. And so we, I, 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 I did one of these interviews at the very beginning of my study. It was very interesting because it was in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. And I had the possibility to meet one of these uh, Mamu with his son, and so his son could translate the, yeah. all the, the questions and the response. And I think it's, it's a very interesting question because, of course, uh, it's very important to have the possibility of these kinds of dialogues. And I, I think it also could apply, in my case, with a French farmer. Why? Because yeah. it was not a, a formal interview. I didn't come to his house and I couldn't see it. No, we were under the rain, uh, walking during two hours. And I, at the beginning, I was not recording, but he asked me, are you recording? I say no. So he, he said, you have to record because you, you, you can't, you, you will not be able to remember all I will uh, tell you. And of course, in his, uh, way of expressing, it was also kind of, of translation between the academic world and the real world. And I yeah. think it's something I want to stress in my, my, in my talk. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, thanks for your answer, Professor. Um, so yes, there's a question in, in the chat uh, from Maria Magisteros. Um, um, I don't know if you can see it. Um, Professor, it there. So, which are the biggest challenges in the process to approach these articulated indigenous processes of resistance, especially when you may when you were considered as an outsider of the community? So, yeah. Okay, another... thank, you. thank you, Maria, uh, for the questions. For the questions, uh, I, I would like to, to to start with the same comment I I I, I just did because I think it's the same process uh, to approach indigenous communities or to approach a French farmer, or maybe to approach any kind of people we have to, 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 to meet and to interact uh, during a research. Because of course, I think the first steps are very important and is how to make a first contact and you have to explain what, you are wanting to you are wanting to do what, what you want to do and what you are expecting from uh, these kinds of meeting, but many times people also ask and okay you are interested in these topics but what can be why can I be interested in giving you some information or or, or relating some kind of of action I'm doing. And many times it's very difficult to answer this question. Uh, all, uh, another time because of this um, separation that can exist between the academic world and, and the real life of the real world. But on the other hand, it is always very interesting to, to notice that in fact, 
people many times want to share their experience. They want to have a conversation, dialogue. And I think as researchers, we have to think we are dialoguing and having these kinds of, of interaction. It is no way the possibility to think uh, we are the researchers and the people we, deals, we deal with uh, are uh, objects of our researchers. Uh, and, and even if we think they are not objects but subjects, they are subjects within our researchers, but they are part of the researchers. They, 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 they bring uh, reflections. And I think it's very important to try to maintain these kinds of, of links. So there is a first step of try, uh, trying to, 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 to have first contacts and then many times things are going because you meet a first person who will uh, help you find another one who can also bring you some information and reflection about his or her activity and so on. So that would be my answer. Professor Ramirez, please. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your presentation. I would like to ask you, first of all, about the subject of memory. In your paper, you talk about collective memory, and this brings me back to Maurice uh, Holbach's. Holbach's position, however, operates within a framework very much influenced by Durkheim that does not give sufficient importance to individuality and to that extent to the various individual memory. In this frame, framework, I would like to know in your ethnographic work with the indigenous communities of Calca, in whose discourse the invocation of collective memory is very important, how this is articulated or transformed with the memory of individuals, with their particular biography, and what are the implications of this uh, intersection with political action? And secondly, but in connection with the above, I would like to know, given your use of live histories and ethnography, to what extent the rhythms and variations of the collective struggles of indigenous communities is subject to transformations, unexpected turns, and non-political activities of political leaders. Yeah? I ask this from the theoretical assumption that um, activists also, uh, the activists have uh, uh, have non-political uh, spheres of life and that uh, these uh, non-political issues have an influence about their political behavior yeah that is the background of life okay thank you carlos um i think uh, about the first question i think it's something that really um struck me with the indigenous experience is the very strong part of the reference to, to, to the collectivity. So to the collective memory. And so the collective, the, some heroes who are um, a kind of uh, reflects of the communal and, and, and the communal, Struggles, so collective struggles from the arrival of the Spaniards. And I, I could say that in any kind of individual uh, dialogue, there was a reference to a collective memory. And so, of course, there are uh, many individual trajectories and there are individual memories of what has been the individual uh, life. So uh, I went to school, but I went to school because I went to school with the, uh, the priests and uh, the nuns and they obliged me to put shoes and they told me I had to, to clean my, my feet and so on. These kinds of, of elements that I could um, retrace as individual trajectories. But at the same time, there was always the reference to some heroes uh, 
uh, that are part of the of the collective memory and I, I, I maybe could say the official speech, the official memory from the indigenous movement. Uh, it's important to, to stress that I am referring to uh, the experience of Kaoka mainly, but in, in fact, also in our past, the heroes can be another ones, but the, 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 the kind of, of speech and references to this sort of uh, collective memory was also very present. And uh, I, I'm not sure I understood well your second question, but you are uh, asking of, uh, about the connection between the idea that activists um, refer to, uh, to, to a separation be be between activism and political action. Yeah, my, my question was uh, about the intersection points uh, between uh, individual political trajectories and the non-political um, uh, uh, fields of the individual biographies. Uh, and what, sorry? And the non-political field of uh, individual trajectories, yeah? How, how th there is a, a relationship between these uh, two levels and how the non-political issues uh, influence the political activity of the leaders. Okay, um, well, I, 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 Paul, my, my voice, are you there? <laughs> or oh, Carlos? Yes, I think mean, what, what Professor Ramirez is, is saying is he's talking about the non-political non aspects of, say, indigenous people's lives, say that the, uh, their domestic um, arrangements, their kinship relations, um, some of their cultural practices that are not okay. strictly part of what we would call the political. And I think he's, uh, Professor is asking about how do you explore um, that intersection between the specifically political and the non-political um, and how that maybe impacts their, okay, um, yeah. their sort of int intentions yeah, yeah. and goals. Thank you. Now, okay, I, I think the first um, step maybe is to define what, what, what is political. Because uh, in fact, in these maybe non-political activities, there are a lot of political elements, and especially in the case of indigenous people, because all what is linked to, to culture is strongly related with the way they are facing the state, facing the nation, facing no indigenous people. So it is a first mm, thing very, very central in, in the action of uh, indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples' relations with uh, in, uh, other political actors. And at the same time, of course, mm, what has been very mm, new in such kinds of, of situations is the fact that from the 1990s, uh, there was this shift uh, into the electoral practice of politics. So there are a lot of relationships and intersection between the cultural elements of daily life and many political elements on the one hand, and there can, there can uh, have a more um, evident separation between the cultural political world on the one hand and the electoral arena on the other hand. And maybe this is one of the problems that uh, have uh, appeared with this uh, projection of the indigenous movement into the electoral arena, because sometimes uh, there uh, can have a feeling among indigenous communities that the representatives don't represent them. Well, it is also a problem that can uh, be found uh, with other kind of, of uh, political representatives. But maybe it's something very strong in the case of indigenous communities because of this very uh, strong relation that can be is seen in the everyday life between 
the cultural elements and, and, and political elements in the way in which the community can survive because in, as, as, uh, it is a question of survival. So how it can maintain internally and how he the community has to, to be sure of strong cultural political uh, equilibrium in order to maintain uh, facing the national society, uh, the state and what we could call colonization general. I hope I am I I I I answered more or less your questions, Carlos. <laughs>